Right, this is um, the beginning of, of hopefully something that's going to generate some interest. Um, we're calling it Detained Television, Detained TV. We're on Instagram and YouTube. And Peter and myself both shared similar experiences in Dubai. And on coming out, we've become involved with an NGO, which was founded by Peter and David Haig. Um, and the intention is to raise a bit of awareness at what's going on in the Middle East and the, the plight of many men who are locked up, sentenced to die, simply because they couldn't afford to pay the bills. This is a debtor's jail. Peter, tell us a little bit about what happened to you. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Martin. Yeah, I'm Peter Margit. Um, um, I, I've actually written a journal about my life and it's called um, when, When's Daddy Coming Home? Um, it's a story, an incredible story about um, a businessman who um, went to Dubai to live the dream and um, like many businessmen um, landed in jail uh, through no fault of his own, simply because um, the business was effectively bankrupt. At the time, the financial crisis had hit the world, Lehman Brothers, um, had wiped out many people's, um, you know, uh, savings. And um, yeah, and we uh, and Martin and some of the other guys have shared um, a cell together or shared the same experiences. And um, the purpose of this is that for me, I spent a long time in jail and um, I've got many friends who are still sat in that jail. And um, people need, in the world need to know really what happens inside the UAE. The lack of human rights, the lack of respect, the racism, um, the religion pushed onto you um, as a bribe to try and leave a jail. Um, and this journey, this epic journey that Martin's taking, and, um, you know, he's a brave man. Uh, we're going to watch him every day, and I'm going to talk to him on his journey, and hopefully we'll meet some people who've shared that experience with us as well on the way, and um, you'll see where he ends up. Um, and I don't know whether we're going to tell you where he ends up, but he'll end up somewhere really amazing and um, hopefully we'll have a big set, big coverage um, for the people that really matter, which are the people who are effectively locked away for the rest of their life and have been forgotten by the British government and other governments in Europe there who are not looking after their citizens' um, human rights. Yeah, I mean, I, Peter, I mean, I've read your book, obviously, um, and I, I a lot of it, um reminded me of you know the things that i endured while i was in there and it's actually a miracle that you're out because i know you were sentenced to 48 years so you should technically still be there we should have actually been sharing the same cell but you managed to get out before i did and i know what a determined individual you are it almost cost you your own life to get out i i met guys in there that were around when you were doing your hunger strike and and while they said to me that in the beginning, we all were hunger striking, but the only person who really took it right to the wire was Peter. A lot of people were were committed in the beginning, but they, no one showed the level of commitment Peter did. And they honestly believed that you would have killed yourself if, if there hadn't have been intervention because you became that determined. And it's obvious to me, knowing you since I've come out, that if you could make something work, you would have done it. So had you had any possibility of making the property deal come to fruition and making yourself and the people involved with you plenty of money, I'm 100% certain you'd have done it. You were just a victim of circumstance. And the fact that you had the tenacity to, to try it, you should have been, you know, you lost everything. Why should you then lose your freedom and potentially lose your life? And I think it shows the type of guy you are that you were actually prepared to end your life because there was no other option open to you and you weren't just going to sit there and waste it and let the days go by without, you know, you were going to do something positive and the only option left open to you positive was, well, if 
you won't ever let me out. I'm not going to stay here. I, I, you know, I, I haven't got a blunt. I haven't got a knife, so I'll just stop eating. Um, which took a massive amount of determination. And as I say, since I've been out, you know, you've shown the same determination to try and get various other things going. So, and I think we, we, as a forum, uh, we're, 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 we're powerful because we're not going away. And the one thing um, regimes don't like is um, people persistently um, telling people about the facts rather than PR companies who they hire telling a, um, subjective uh, things and un unfactual uh, things to muddy the water to make themselves look like this uh, beautiful democracy uh, in, in the, the jewel in the desert. And, um, you know, on your journey, we're going to meet people on the way. And um, I think hopefully what it will do is it will raise enough awareness about the subject matter that we, we really want to talk about, which is our friends, bottom line, who are stuck in jail for ridiculous sentences, life sentences for a debt. Yeah, a debt is jail. And, and we've, we've got to change that. And we will change that. Yeah, it's Dickensian. It's reminiscent of Newgate Jail yeah. in London 200 and two, over 200 years ago. You know, they, we used to deport people to Australia because they stole a loaf of bread and people would be locked up simply because they couldn't afford to pay their rent. Uh, it, but, you know, all of this ended 200 years ago in civilised countries. We've moved forward. We've learned. And, yeah, I, I, you and I, neither of us, we're not perfect men. You know, we've taken chances. But yeah. I don't think that, you know any of us should ever be locked away for the rest of our lives because we took a chance on a deal and it didn't turn out right. If we made money, we, you and I have both been generous and everyone around us has benefited. And then there's been times when, when things get tough and, and we lose everything, but to, to, to lose your liberty for the, or to lose the rest of your life. I mean, I know what happened to me. I, at the time that I was in jail, the people that, put me there, paid the police to have me put there. They then never even bothered to follow through with a civil claim. As they, if I was locked up out of spite. If they thought I owed them some money, why didn't they claim it? In the time yeah. that I was in there, I lost everything. I had a business, I lost the business. I had a partner, I lost her. I've come out of jail and in my fifties to nothing, a broken man. I'm doing, and I'm doing this because I promised the guys I left behind I would try to do something to raise awareness to their plight. There are guys that have finished sentences of 12 and 15 years, and when they think that they're due to be released, they get handed another 20 for, for another spurious debt that's occurred in the 15 years while they've been in jail, unable to do anything. It's... I mean, I well, was in jail actually, with... I, actually, I think what happened was that they created a law specifically for them guys, specifically not to let them out of jail. So the law was uh, passed after they'd actually committed the actual crime. So they actually put a law in place post uh, crime and um, are keeping them there on this uh, pay and go policy that they have and everyone has to pay to stay in jail they make us buy our food they make us buy our clothes i did the numbers you know that jail just the section i was in was getting fifty six thousand dollars a week in canteen revenue it's three million dollars a year in revenue for the money that we have to pay from our families mm. so that we can eat and i couldn't even get i'm a vegetarian come vegan and for a while, the embassy arranged that they, they could have food that I could eat. But when they fell out with the catering company at the end of September and they would change catering company and the outgoing catering company, probably like anyone who finishes a government contract in Dubai, wasn't paid. <laughs> so while the new company took over, it was in the period that coming towards my release. I went eight weeks without food. I came out, I weighed seven. You saw me when I fell off the plane, yeah. I was 72 yeah. kilos. I lost yeah. five and a half stone in body weight. They just didn't feed me. 
and yeah. I was ringing the embassy every day. You did a hunger strike. They yeah. starved me. It's, <laughs> it's, yeah. I think they just and want to You don't us. have to pay for Weight Watchers in there anyway, do you? No, you don't have to pay for Weight Watchers. But the fact that we all have to pay to be there, we have to buy our soap, we have to buy our toothpaste, we have to buy completely, our food. Completely. Yeah. $3 million a yeah. year from the building to where I was, all financial criminals, all guys, when I say financial criminals, guys who'd lost their jobs or lost their businesses and couldn't pay their bills. So that mm. makes them a criminal. The fact that they haven't mm. been paid by someone further up the food chain or they've been fired by a large local employer has caused their financial difficulty and because they're unable to pay their debt, they're thrown into jail. And then what little money they had, their family has, has to be expended in actually feeding them while they're in there. The place is, it's, it's a hotel where the guests can't leave. And yeah, it, yeah. And that's, a, that, that's another interesting part is there's a lot of people who aren't actually in jail, but are in the bigger jail in the UAE where they can't leave. And then lots of them are there for a decade or so, unable to work, but don't have their travel rights. They've had a travel ban. They've had their passport taken from them. And, um, and they're unable to work because they haven't got a passport and a work permit. And they're sitting there on a civil matter, which they, um, um, they can't resolve because they can't earn. Yeah, I, I, the stories that I heard when I was in, and the mm. thing is, while I was there, yeah, I had a great life. And I had the blinkers on and I bought into it and, and I thought mm. everything was great. But I kind of knew behind the scenes that there was something not quite right. And But I just never really thought what happened to me could ever happen. I just thought it just, it's never actually going to happen. And then when it did, I thought surely someone's going to step in. I'd, I'd seen so many benevolent acts by the rulers. They always make things right. And when there's a problem, they step in. And I always thought that the guys, you know, the guys that are in jail, there must be more to their stories than I, than I know. And there's obviously yeah, a reason completely. why they're there. And then I, since I've been in there and met them and I've come out and done my research, it's unbelievable. I cannot believe that this country gets away with what it does. I mean, I'm watching at the minute on the news, they're, they're, they're saying things about Iran because they've detained a lady which I think is terrible and I hope she gets to come home soon, but it's got a little bit of a political edge to it. And it's a one particular woman. And she probably is the only UK citizen that's, or UK woman that is detained in Iran at the moment. I, I don't know of any others, but it's certainly getting a lot of press coverage. And yet in the same week that this woman is, the, the press is bemoaning her terrible situation, I notice Albert Douglas, has just been handed three years for his son's debts. That's not making the UK press. And I know of at least two dozen Brits that are sentenced to die in Alawea for, for monetary debt, not criminal offence, purely monetary debt, business failure, nothing more, debtors jail. And the UK press says nothing about them. They're never coming home. They're going to die in jail. We all know that this poor lady in Iran at some stage, there'll be a deal that's done between the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and she'll come home to her husband and children. And I'm sure she's probably been cared for quite nicely by the Iranians. So I think they're actually probably far more civilized. Um, yeah. But they're, they're the bogeyman. And obviously the press wants to make this country look bad. But what about Dubai? It's 10 times worse. It makes Iran look like mother care. <laughs>